Mean variance optimization relies heavily on market forecasts to determine fund asset allocation. Often this technique is used by fund managers to determine the correct asset allocation for a fund. But when the market forecasts uh, fail to materialize, what then? Is there not a more intelligent way to construct portfolios? We're delving into this topic with Tony Bell joining us from Cape Town. Tony, good to have you with us. So before we get into the new way of a uh, asset allocation, talk to us about uh, mean variance optimization. What does that mean in in layman's terms to tell us about the traditional techniques uh, that are being used by fund managers. Sure, thanks very much for the invite of having me on your show. Mean variance optimization is in fact is indeed a very very big word but it can really be broken down into two simple parts. What, what folk have done to try and understand the future is they model the past so they take a hundred years worth of data and they have a look to see how each asset class, equities, bonds, cash behaves every month and then they draw what they call a distribution, what the statisticians would call a distribution. The distribution really gives you two bits of information. It says what you can expect on average from each asset class and it also tells you how much that average will vary. So in South African terms what we find if we look back long enough is we find that equities produce an average real return of around six to eight percent and that can be as poor as minus twenty percent or it might be twenty percent higher than that and that's what the, uh, the statisticians would refer to as the deviation around the return. Mm -hmm. what, what then happens in terms of trying to make sense of how to model the portfolio is these return distributions are put into a mathematical model which then says on the assumption that your estimate of the return is correct, i.e. around 6% for equities, a little bit lower for bonds, this is the type of allocation that you should have between equities, bonds and cash if, for example, you want to target CPI plus 5. So that's mean variance optimization in all its simplicity. What we find that uh, is a little wrong with it is that the return distribution doesn't really describe what happens when things go wrong with the broader macroeconomic environment and economies move into recession. And in very simple terms, the estimate of return, the 6%, is simply too high. And that's why we use a different approach back at Vunani. So let's go into the new way of uh, asset allocation. Well, before we start talking about the way in which uh, Vinani and them, or so I say Tony and them are busy slicing and dicing asset allocation, is let me just show you a graphical representation of what Tony has just spoken about. Just have a look at your screen and uh, you just look at the relationship between some of, the, some of the asset classes that are available to South African investors. Now, I mean, it's quite a busy slide. So let me just explain to you quickly what you're looking at over here. Is you're looking at returns on this axis over here. And these are annualized real returns from 1991 to 2011. Now, let's assume you were sitting in a really bad economy. Hence, people are trying to mitigate risk. Well, guess what the returns are that you'd be making from equities? Well, you'd be getting a return that's somewhere down, down over here. In a normal state, you'd be getting a return that's somewhere over here. And well, let's assume people were risk seeking, well, you'd be getting a return over here. And this is just historical data. So this is now going back in time. This is what the numbers would look like. But let's assume they shift and they look something like that. What do you do then? Then quite frankly, garbage in, garbage out. Because quite frankly, whatever numbers you put into a system like this, what it you doesn't not, mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. It is. I mean, Ronnie, would you would you agree with something like that? Yeah, we can't rely on the, on the past entirely, and I think uh, the 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 word we're going to be using just now is is sort of looking at scenarios or regimes because economies go through some abrupt changes and ca and that can happen quite quickly. Um, so you need to have a model that also looks forward, and you need to have a model that. Uh, um, uh, or a fund management process that can adapt to these kind of changing market conditions. But Tony, take, take us through a sort of what, what you call a, a, a scenario-based approach. Okay. The way I normally explain this uh, and to make sense to, to, to the viewer is very simple when I use a sailing analogy. If, uh, if you follow the Volvo Ocean Race, uh, it's a very technical discipline, it's a very demanding discipline and it takes a lot of skill to manage those very high powered boats. But what everyone will understand is that uh, you don't sail with the same sail under all conditions. So what we did was we looked back to 1929 and we said, is the world always the same? And we came up with the very clear observation that no, the world is not always the same. 
economies expand, economies contract, their growth spurts, their recessionary spurts, their inflation spurts, and their deflationary spurts. And so what we did was we then went and had a look to see how each asset class behaves within each of those different environments. And we tried to group the world into a set of descriptors, if you like, that make sense. And we came up with three very simple descriptors. We said that the world would either be in a bad state, or a normal state, or a good state. And if I draw it through to the sailing analogy, a little bit like the southeaster at the moment, it's blowing like crazy in Cape Town. So you've got a world which could potentially be in a very bad state, uh, stormy conditions if you were sailing. On a normal day, normal sailing conditions apply and occasionally, very occasionally, you get very good sailing conditions where the spinnaker can come out and, and very good speeds can be achieved. And what was important for us was, was a two, parts, uh, two parts of the puzzle to solve. The first one was to work out a mechanism to figure out which state we were in. And the second part was to figure out what to do with our client's asset allocation framework knowing or believing that we were in one state or the other. So in a risk mitigating state, if the storm is coming, what you want to do is you want to take a lot of risk off the table. You don't want to be assuming in that state that equities give you a 6% real return. Our data in fact shows us that the real return that you can expect from equities is negative. And so you want to remove the risk of being in equities when you're going into when you go when you're likely to go into very stormy sailing conditions mm -hmm. so the framework that we've developed is a very simple one we have a bad state which is linked to what we call a risk mitigating asset allocation framework we have a normal state normal sailing conditions normal framework and that's what the industry would recognize as being the long-term strategic asset allocation framework on the upside we've got the opportunity seeking state which uh, we call um, the Opportunity Seeking uh, Asset Allocation Framework as well. Yeah. So, so what you've then got is you've got three different states of the economy to describe the broader macroeconomic economy, and you've got three asset allocation frameworks that match uh, how you would position the client's portfolio in each of those states. Roland, you know, you spend a lot of time looking at the correct asset allocation uh, for portfolios. Does this make sense to you taking the macro environment into account and shifting the portfolio in line with it? I think there's no doubt that we have to take the macro in environment into account, especially um, uh, not just looking at the current macro environment, but looking at where we're going. But uh, where it really gets interesting and what we're trying to uh, probably uh, where we can challenge Tony maybe is to discuss what are the variables or what are the dynamics that determine whether you're in a good or a bad state. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you look at it slightly differently, Tony. You don't look at inflation and GDP growth necessarily. necessarily. So uh, just take us through the, the inputs that decide whether we're in a good, ba good or bad state and maybe just tell us where we are right now. Um, where we are right now, I think Dr. Elerian has described quite uh, appropriately as a new normal. In building our macroeconomic indicator, what we did was we looked at how the world works from a very pragmatic perspective. And we see the world with two component parts, what central banks do and the choices that you and I make as consumers and that companies make as part of the real economy. So we set out to build an indicator based on the assessment of whether central banks were supplying liquidity to the market or withdrawing liquidity from the market. That would be our leading indicator. And then the lagging indicator really comprises of high frequency measures of what's happening in the real economy. When we looked at GDP, we found GDP to be a fairly blunt measure. It's, it's typically measuring the wrong stuff. Uh, for those of the folk that out there that don't really know what GDP comprises, it's a simple equation. It looks at consumption plus government expenditure plus the investment cycle plus net exports. What we were really interested in was from a liquidity perspective the price of money, interest rates, inflation whether it was going up or down, money supply whether it was expanding or contracting, and the velocity of money. Those are the four factors that go into our leading indicator. The lagging indicator would make sense to, to everybody. It's whether jobs are being created or destroyed, 
whether consumer spending is going up or down, whether consumer sentiment is improving or weakening, and what's happening at the manufacturing level, are companies producing more or less? And then from a retail perspective, are companies stocking with, uh, so increasing their stock levels or decreasing their stock levels? Mm -hmm. So by putting those two indicators together, we came up with an overall indicator, which when we go back to 1929, does a pretty good job of describing what regime we're in and the movement between the regimes. So that, of course, called the composite indicator. Yeah, I mean, let's 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 That's just show correct. a visual of what that of what that actually looks like. Just have a look at your uh, just have a look at this the following graph, and there you can see the composite indicator, and that is now what Tony and them have built at Venani. That's the that's in blue there relative to domestic equities, and that's now the 12 month change. You can see how the two actually actually track each other over time, mm -hmm. and um, you know how how the two are actually correlated and I mean that becomes a precursor then obviously for understanding asset allocation and for understanding where potentially the cycle is going to be going from I mean just to maybe what we need to do is put some numbers to this as well we've got a table that I'd like to show you that basically just summarizes some of the findings that uh, that Venani actually utilizes from an asset allocation perspective and there you can see it I mean, and we've showed this on the show before, and it's just absolutely fascinating re reading. It shows equities at the top end, bonds, the next asset class down, and cash. It shows you the bad state, normal state, and the good state, and now it shows you the returns. And let's just focus on equities, because the other ones kind of just fall into place. Look at the return on an annualized five-year basis that you can get out of equities in a bad state relative to the probability for equities to do worse than inflation at 47.7%. In a normal state, you see how those kind of just converge. And you can see there's your, there's, your, there's your real return for equities at 8.1%. And in a good state, look at it, 11.9%. Probability that equities will do worse than inflation? Well, quite frankly, 0.3%. I mean, Tony, that for me is, is fascinating. I mean, the stats here are just uncanny. They absolutely just do kind of speak to the whole story. Yeah. Kirby, they speak to the story, and hopefully they also just are common sense. I think anybody... Uh, that's lived for more than about 30 years will have been through economic recessions and recoveries. And typically what happens in an economic recession is people cut back on their expenditure because they're concerned about pres preserving their own, uh, their own standard of living. And they often are faced with declining house prices, declining asset prices. So there's a strong element of conserving and preserving wealth. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a time like 2007 where credit was being thrown at you, there's more of an expansive mood and people feel more comfortable in spending. So for us the logical link was firstly to recognize that different regimes exist or different economic states exist. Then secondly to work out and understand how to uh, measure and identify which regime we were in. And then thirdly, the most important one was to work out whether it worked in terms of asset allocation. And what we find is that the whole notion of investing for the long term might have a few fundamental flaws in it. And I know I'm treading on very shaky ground over here because that is the advice that's been given out by advisors to the market for many years. We find that there's an adjunct to it, if you like, it's investing for the long term, but being able to manage the drawdown as part of the journey that becomes critically important because where you destroy wealth, both in a retirement savings vehicle and in an institutional pension fund, is not, about, not by getting the long, the, the long term incorrect. It's about mismanaging the drawdown risk in the short term. T Tony, I just want to... Uh, um pose you a kind of scenario that we are currently in and, and let's try and map that into into the table that uh, Kirby just put up. Um, I know you guys don't look at this but let's look at the traditional kind of view that currently we're having quite disappointing sort of GDP growth um, and rising inflation. Now that would yes. mean we're sort of in an unhealthy state and let's assume we can call it something similar to a bad state uh, which is the way you guys measured it. Um, now, in your bad state, you obviously want to, as you explained, have less in equities and more in sort of cash and bonds. But what we're facing at the moment is a situation where certainly I am earning less in my bank account than inflation. So I am actually guaranteed to underperform inflation with a high cash or, or bond allocation at the moment. Um, can you maybe explain uh, what uh, asset allocation in this current scenario is, is sort of ideal? Sure. 
I think the, the, the interesting uh, way in which to look at that question is to try and see the world in, its, in all its complexity but yet its simplicity. The, the policy framework that's driving the US, the Eurozone, China and South Africa are indeed quite different. In the US you're still sitting with largely deflationary pressures. Companies have restructured themselves over the last three years to become very lean. Most companies in the US are very cash flush and for most of them that have got good products their earnings power has been very strong through this period. Couple that with the, the unprecedented liquidity that the Fed has supplied to the market creates a very powerful driver of equity prices. In South Africa the drivers are slightly different. Domestic inflation is rising, that's absolutely true, that has an impact on our bond market. But many of our companies have taken their earnings base offshore and therefore their earnings power rests in sources outside of South Africa and that's what we assess when we look at the potential return from each company that we have in our portfolio. When we uh, discussed the sort of brief for the show, we also looked at the, the question of anchoring, which becomes important. And what we found in our research is that without something like the macro indicator, it's uh, very easy to, in a sense, be uh, waylaid, if you like, or, or, or to go off on a tangent about what factors may or may not be considered important in any investment discussion. And those factors change over time. So today we might be discussing inflation and buying power. Tomorrow we might be discussing jobs and the Eurozone debt crisis. The problem that most people have is that it's very difficult to synthesize that into a framework that's continuous, which allows you consistency in how you apply that pr this process. And that's why by having the composite indicator, it takes a lot of that noise out. And it says to us at the moment, you're slightly better than normal, largely because there's been a very significant uh, push by central banks around the world to expand liquidity flows. And whilst economies are in a very different state of uh, recovery and in some, in fact, in, in, in a state of heightened distress, yeah. the interaction between the liquidity environment and the real economy creates mm -hmm. a slightly above average picture from an asset allocation perspective. Yeah, I mean, you know, this stuff is critically important to me because I think that, um, firstly, we've got new thinking coming to the foreground as far as asset allocation is concerned. I mean, MVO and the thinking around mean variance optimization and any of its kind of derivatives that you would utilize in asset allocation, much of that theory is actually very, very old. I mean, it's kind of sp it's spoken about and taught at finance 101 level at, 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 university, at, at university stage. What we're looking at here is we're looking at a whole new way of doing things. Is this the right way? Well, it certainly has its merits. And uh, hopefully there's going to be a lot more debate around where asset allocation could be, do more, be done more robustly into the future. Yeah. 